You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Skinny Pop Popcorn. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Oh, so light and crunchy. Skinny Pop Original Popcorn is the snack you've been searching for. Made with just three simple ingredients, popcorn kernels, sunflower oil, and salt. Snacking never felt or tasted so good. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Give yourself permission to snack and pick up Skinny Pop Original Popcorn today. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. If you look around, there are so many ways to make a difference. At Capella University, our FlexPath format gives you a different way to earn your degree. Take courses at your speed. Move on whenever you're ready. Education should fit your life. Learn more at capella.edu. When running a business, your employees can create all kinds of interesting situations, like getting complaints because someone on the team always smells horrible. You better talk to Bambi. Or someone isn't showing up when they're supposed to. Talk to Bambi. Or an employee reports a serious issue, like sexual harassment, and you're not sure if you have a documented policy. You really need to talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost eighty grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Visit Bambi.com slash assistant right now. Spelled Bam, B-E-E dot com slash assistant. Bambi.com slash assistant. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to You Did What Now, the history podcast that is not your history class with me, your superfluous host, Katie Charlewood, filthy heathen and reader of books. Welcome if you are new and welcome back if you are, if you're not. And wow, we, we are on the last queen. We've made it. I made it. I made it. I don't know how I made it because I started late in the month and somehow managed to pull this off. What? Okay, I am notorious for not being able to follow through on things. Like, um, I will have a great plan and I'll start doing something and then I'll always fall like near the end but here we are. Proof I can finish a task. Screw you, ADHD. You don't own me. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber and fact me. Well, okay. But as you know, we have to get our source on first. So let's start, shall we? We have Catherine Parr, wife, widow, mother, survivor, the story of the last queen of Henry VIII by Elizabeth Norton. Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's last love by Susan James. Catherine the Queen, The Remarkable Life of Catherine Parr by Linda Porter. And of course, we have the Files.com, Biography.com, and History.com. There we go. So let's, let's just, let's get into our facting, shall we? Catherine Parr was born in 1512, probably in August, which honestly is probably the closest date we've had for somebody, I think, since... Catherine of Aragon, right? Yeah, like we haven't had like a decent or exact or, you know, anything one could even argue could be an exact date for any of the queens, I think, until this. But yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So Catherine Parr was the eldest child of Sir Thomas Parr. He was the lord of the manor of Kendal in Westmoreland, which is um now Cumbria, by the way, and Maud Green, daughter and co-heiress of Sir Thomas Green. Lord of Greens Norton, Northamptonshire, and Joan Fogg. So, um, Sir Thomas Parr, her dad, he was a descendant of King Edward III. And the Parrs were a very noble northern family, which even included knights. 
So Catherine had a younger brother, William, who was the first Marquess of Northampton, and a younger sister, Anne, who would become the Countess of Pembroke. So her dad, he was this close companion to Henry VIII, and he was rewarded with um, responsibilities and incomes, with positions including the Sheriff of Northamptonshire, Master of the Wards, and Comptroller to the King, and this is on top of being Lord of the Kendal. Her dad's all buddy with Henry VIII. But her mother, Maud, she was a friend and a lady-in-waiting for Catherine of Aragon, who was Catherine Parr's godmother, and as far as we know, is who she was named after. It's actually kind of funny when you think about it, because Catherine Parr's godmother is Queen Catherine of Aragon, and so, like, Henry VIII's life comes, like, full circle, his married life comes full circle. Like, how weird is that? So Catherine was born probably in August in 1512 and like initially they thought it was the Kendall Castle in Westmoreland but it was in sort of a state of disrepair and Maud Parr, she had stayed at court when she was pregnant and they were living in a townhouse in Blackfriars and so it's more likely that she was born in Blackfriars instead of Kendall Castle. So Maud, Catherine's mother, she managed the court school. And so we know that she was intelligent, especially to be put in that place by Catherine of Aragon. When Catherine is five years old in 1517, Sir Thomas Parr dies. And so Maud is a widowed mother and has three children. And Maud, even though she's still pretty young at this point, never remarries because she doesn't want to endanger her children's inheritance. Instead of remarrying, she devotes the rest of her life to ensuring her children are educated and have advantageous marriages. So growing up, Catherine is an avid learner. She really dislikes embroidery and sewing though. It's just not her thing. I think was it the quote that she said was, my hands are ordained to touch crowns and scepters, not spindles and needles. Um, But it just sounds like something made up. I think it's just one of those whispers that sort of evolved over time. Catherine is incredibly intelligent. She was fluent in French and Latin and Italian and she would continue learning languages. When she actually becomes queen, she starts learning Spanish. Like, in general, her initial education was really similar to other sort of well-born women. You know, household management, uh, music, arithmetic, like all the sort of, like, basics. But she just really enjoyed learning. So, in 1529, when she was 17 years old, Catherine marries for the first time, and it's Sir Edward Burrough, whose grandfather is the second Baron Burrough. I should probably mention, like, Catherine had bright hazel eyes and was about five foot ten, so she was pretty tall for ladies of the time. This marriage is, you know, they're relatively close in age, and Edward is a knight, and he's in his twenties. He served as a fiofi and a justice of the peace, and unfortunately, like, he just had... Unfortunately, he was in pretty poor health. And so, in 1533, Sir Edward Burrard dies in the springtime, I think, and never gets to inherit the title of Baron Burra. And so, at the age of 21, I think she's, like, 21 or 22 at this point, and she is childless and widowed for the first time. Her first husband dies, and Catherine is spending time with the Dowager Lady Strickland, Catherine Neville who is um, her cousin's widow, and she would stay at the, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, Sizerg Castle in Westmoreland, again, now Cumbria, and in the summer of 1534, she marries John Neville, the third Baron Latimer, who is the, um, who is her dad's second cousin, by the way. Latimer had been widowed twice, and he was like double the age of Catherine, and luckily for her, he was also independently wealthy. And Latimer had two children with his, I think, from his first marriage of Dorothy de Vere. Two children, John and Margaret. Even though he was independently wealthy, Latimer was still in financial difficulties. Secondly, which is, um, its own thing, but what doesn't help Latimer is that he opposed Henry's first annulment um, to Catherine of Aragon and then the marriage to Anne Boleyn. So, during the Lincolnshire Rising um, in October 1536, these Catholic rebels sort of show up and threaten Latimer. So, like, if he doesn't join them and sort of fight against 
you know, the, the, the Protestant Reformation that's happening, it's going to be grr arg and boo violence, I'm telling you. And Catherine watched these Catholic rebels drag her husband away, leaving her and her stepchildren alone between October 1536 and April 1537, which is probably one of the reasons why Catherine was so opposed to this rebellion and why she had such faith in the reformation of the church when things like this are happening. During this time, in January 1537, there is an uprising of the North and Catherine and her stepchildren, so that's John and Margaret and Catherine, they're held hostage at Snape Castle in Yorkshire. As they're being held hostage, word gets sent to Lord Latimer that he has to return or else they're just going to slaughter them all. He returns and somehow manages to talk the rebels into releasing his family and leaving. Which, um, I don't know about you, but that sounds suspicious. So Henry VIII and Cromwell, you know, they, they hear conflicting reports and they're like, is he a victim? Is he a co-conspirator? And if he was a co-conspirator, all of the family's lands would be forfeited and they'd all be left penniless. Although no charges were ever laid against Lord Latimer, the very rumours themselves were so damaging that the whole family had to move to the south because the opinion in the north, because they were so looked down upon in the north. And during this time, and Thomas Cromwell, the absolute twat bucket, he starts blackmailing Latimer, making him do his bidding. And it wasn't until Cromwell's demise that the entire Latimer's crowd returned home. Cromwell died in 1540 and the Latimer's, they actually managed to get, reclaim some of their dignity back. And, and by 1542, the family are spending time in London because Latimer is attending Parliament and Catherine is visiting her brother William and her sister Anne at court. And it's generally around this time that she is acquainted with Sir Thomas Seymour, which is Jane Seymour's brother. And Catherine really enjoyed the atmosphere of court because, you know, it was very different to all the rural estates that she was used to attending. So she would learn about fashion and trends and jewellery and also religious matters. So by the winter of 1542, Lord Latimer, he's sick as fuck and his condition just gets worse and worse. And Catherine is nursing her husband until his death in 1543. So he leaves the well, leaving Catherine um, as the guardian of his daughter Margaret and put in charge of his affairs until his daughter's of age. So he also leaves Catherine the manor of Stowe and like a bunch of other properties and he leaves her money to support his daughter. It seems that Catherine genuinely mourned the passing of her husband. She kept a copy of his New Testament Bible with her and his name was on the inside and she kept that with her until her death. So Catherine at this point is again a childless widow and she's 31 at this point. She's got a decent income, she's got a guardianship of her stepdaughter which gives her great position as well and she is rich enough if she wants to marry on her own terms. So Catherine Parr, she's only four years older than Mary Tudor. And after her second husband dies, she decides to rekindle this friendship and finds a place in Mary's entourage at court. Let's just let this sink in a little bit, um, because this means that Henry VIII would have probably known Catherine Parr as a child. He knew her dad, he knew her mum. I'm just, I'm just saying. So Catherine was at court because she had her eye on Thomas Seymour and she, being at court meant she gets to be around him. So Catherine Parr, so she's, you know, in Mary's social circle and, you know, she's got her eye on Thomas Seymour. He's got his eye on her and, and they were even discussing, like seriously discussing marriage. Catherine is still known as Lady Latimer at this point. She has this incredible interest in the philosophies of the Reformation and Protestant beliefs and her religious and spiritual pursuits, they would be, these would be a huge influence on her later writings and of course, her younger stepchildren. But we'll get back to that in a minute. So she's at court and uh, she's being dazzled by Thomas Seymour, who was <clears throat> dashing, handsome, charming, and relatively close in age to Catherine. Whereas Henry, who was interested in Catherine, 
Ah, uh, didn't have these particular qualities. However, he was the fucking king of England. And, and Ireland at that point too, because he decided to grab that name. And Catherine... I've seen people say that she took the smart choice, like she chose this. I think when the king, when the king chooses you, you don't really have much of a choice. So she writes, so she sends a Dear John rejection letter to Thomas Seymour. And she says, My mind was fully bent to marry you before any man I knew. But God made that impossible which seemed to me impossible. But Henry had his eye on Catherine before she was interested in Thomas Seymour because when she was still married to her second husband he was sending her gifts so like before Lord Latimer dies he's sending her gifts of gowns and jewels and a bunch of other stuff and like two weeks before he dies she he's sending this stuff to her and what's funny about Catherine Parr is she is the only one that was Henry's real choice because everybody else had been put in place they had been set in front of him and it had been working from one way or the other. You had politicians, diplomats, members of the aristocracy from like Howard's, Boleyn, Seymour's and fucking Cromwell. And they all pushed their own people in front of Henry VIII and they all had their own agendas. But nobody was going for Catherine. I mean, you could argue that. The reason that nobody was pushing anybody in Henry's way at the time, because they, they, they've seen what happened to Cromwell. So they thought, maybe, maybe not, because, like, when, when anybody who seems to put something in the way, like, when you champion somebody, or, I mean, unless you're the Duke of Norfolk, who somehow manages to escape from the tyranny of fucking Henry, everybody else just gets dead. You know what I mean? Like, everybody's just fucking dead. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown, and his life. Follow even the royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge even the royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. So Henry wants Catherine, and he will have been made aware of the discussions that, that Lady Latimer and Sir Thomas Seymour were having regarding betrothal and marriage. So Seymour gets sent to Brussels to remove him from court to sort of take away that barrier um, gently, one might say. So she accepts Henry's proposal and they get married on the 12th of July, 1543 at Hampton Court Palace. And this is like four months after the death of Lord Latimer. Like it's, it's not a long time. Fun fact. So Catherine actually has a coronation and she was the first Queen of England to also be titled the Queen of Ireland because Henry decided that he owned that too. So Henry and Catherine were like, they were actually related by Henry's mum. And Catherine's dad, they were third cousins once removed. And by the both their dads, they were double fourth cousins once removed. I, I'll be honest with you, that's a lot of back and forth. They, they were related, distantly. So when Catherine becomes queen, she makes Margaret Neville, her former stepdaughter, uh, she makes her a lady-in-waiting. And she also, and also her stepson John's wife, Lucy Somerset, she also gets a position in her household. So Catherine Parr, she's married Henry, who's like, how old is he now? He's not twice her age, but he is like 20 years older than she is. Is he not? Like, so he's like, nearly, he's got nearly two decades on her, which, um, super. So now Catherine being married to fucking Henry. So like, can you imagine being Catherine and you have to like match up to the sexual fantasies of an immobile, 
ulcerated, temperamental gobshine who suffered from impotence and anguished insomnia was how it was told. Like, so we don't have like a lot of evidence regarding um the inner workings of the bedroom, but it seems like it seems like she utilized everything she could. So she had clothes, perfumes. Uh, she furnished the chamber in a particular way. Uh, food, drink, conversation, and milk baths to provide the right ambience for when he visited her uh, her bedroom, really, her chamber. So Catherine Parr is similar to Henry's first two wives when it comes to intelligence. But she was neither as reserved as Catherine of Aragon or as fiery as Anne Boleyn. And Catherine Parr, she really worked at making the marriage work. She had to be so careful and she had to protect herself, especially because she would have been very aware of what happened to the previous five. I mean, Jane Seymour, eh. But so like at least four out of five wives had a, had a, had a shitty time of it, really. So she had to be careful not to jeopardise her position. But unlike like Anna Cleves, she wasn't pragmatic. She was very much enjoying her position and all the perks that came with it. And unlike a lot of the other previous wives, we have lots of writing and and letters from her. During her marriage with Henry, it was the time for the reformers. Like the sort of reformation had stalled effectively when Cromwell lost his head. Um, and there's this plot against Cranmer and which which just collapses because the people involved, like um like Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, just fucks it up. Queen Catherine, she basically has this continual day-to-day influence and which brings the evangelicals of court and the council of Edward Seymour, the Earl of Hertford, to have a controlling influence, um, which would be very important when Henry died in 1547. Catherine is incredible because not only does she somehow manage to continue spreading her faith, she studies the Bible and listens to preachers in, um, in chambers with her ladies. And she advances the careers of, you know, her favourite clergy. And which is like pretty normal. She did something that no woman at the time could do. She wrote, she published devotional books, um, basically Psalms, prayer books in 1544 and 1545. And then in 1546, when she after Henry passes, she starts writing this um, personal testimony called The Lamentation of a Sinner. She talks about her journey from um, Catholicism into Lutheranism and basically explains why her faith is her faith. So yeah, after Henry's death, she publishes The Lamentations of a Sinner and finally comes out as like a fully blown Protestant. Catherine Parr, she holds some titles. So she is the last wife of Henry VIII. She is the most married queen on the English throne with, you know, four marriages under her belt. And and she was the first woman, English woman, in English women's literary history to have a book authored under her own name. And this was the Prayers or Meditations in 1545. And this was the first book to be openly published by a woman in the English language. Earlier on, she had published um, translations of Latin psalms into English called Psalms or Prayers, um, but these were all done anonymously. So Catherine really utilised her role as Queen Consort and effectively, and she used every option she had, every means of her disposal to spread effectively what would be known as um, Protestantism, like So yeah, so Catherine was dealing with day-to-day stuff at court. She was, for all we know, and because we haven't heard anything opposite to it, was satisfying Henry in the chamber. She would, and she would like attend to his ulcers and his leg herself. Like she would change the dressing, she would clean the wounds. And she managed to get the vainest man in the world to finally wear reading glasses. So while Catherine's married to the king, she manages to get, she manages to reconnect Henry with his children, more so than Jane did, because she brought the the children back for like Christmas and stuff. So it was only for like the big feast days. So you've got Mary, who's 28, Elizabeth, who's 11, and Edward, who's seven. And they're living in all these royal manors in the home counties. 
So Mary is illegitimate. Elizabeth is double illegitimate. And Edward is a boy, so he's fine. And, um, and the girls, you know, were currently excluded from court. And Edward, he was... And as, you know, the only heir, he was kept away from away from the capital because the plague was back. You know what I mean? And so within a few months, she has the children visiting Henry on a regular basis. And what Catherine does is not only does she reconcile the family, but also puts Mary and Elizabeth back into the line of succession. Like she debastards them. You know what I mean? And she really had a warm relationship with all of her stepchildren. She was tutoring Edward in Latin to help him improve it. A lot of her Protestant reformist ideas and ideologies, you can really see this in play when it comes to, and the influence it had on Edward and Elizabeth. So she's nursing him. She's connecting him back with his children. Um, But Catherine Parr also has this prominent role in Henry's affairs. So Henry is on campaign in France because, you know, every now and again he likes to go on an excursion and uh, start some fights. So he's in France between, uh, like, the, the middle of July and the end of September. And Catherine is left to oversee a regency council, which was actually headed by the Archbishop Cranmer. So yeah, he's away campaigning, she's a regent, and she was also entrusted, but she wasn't just appointed as a regent for the campaign. Henry put it in place that if he were to die on campaign, she would be she would keep acting as a regent for Prince Edward. And while she's doing all this, her daily duties and It's believed that Elizabeth spent a lot of time with her. What's funny as well was that in 1546, even though Catherine Parr and Henry had this pretty solid marriage, especially considering compared to his other marriages, there was this failed plot to replace her with a new queen, uh, Mary Howard, who had recently been widowed. So the plan was, I swear to God, the plan was Mary's brother wanted wanted her to marry Thomas Seymour, thus placing her in front of the king so she would slide into the position of the Henry's mistress and oust Catherine Parr. Like, that was the plan, but it, it, uh, it failed. But this wasn't the only plot against her. The Lord Chancellor at the time and this Catholic faction at court, they wanted to, like, oust Catherine as a heretic um, because she was Protestant and... And so what they wanted to do was align her with Anne Askew, who was this, um, because she was an evangelical um, Christian and who was already under arrest for heresy. Sidebar, Anne Askew is the first woman on record to like ever be a victim of um, persecution and torture in the Tower of London. And like this was supposedly done so that, As- so that Anne would um, basically give up power and any of her ladies-in-waiting as Protestants and so on and so forth. Anne gets burned to death, but um, without ever implicating Queen Catherine. And and so these suspicions come about, and, and this is like, I think, early 1546. So, so Henry and Catherine have this re- religious, theological argument of some kind, and Henry is convinced that she's her- heretic and, and signs, and he signs a warrant for the arrest of Catherine. And in a crazy random happenstance, the warrant for her arrest manages to fall conveniently in front of her door. And so she gets a heads up, which unfortunately neither Anne Berlin nor Catherine Howard got. Catherine Parr does the smartest thing possible. She says, fuck this for a game of soldiers, heads over to Henry and goes, me? A weak woman? A weak, foolish woman? You think I could stand up to you? What? And she basically flatters him and is self-deprecating panders to his ego and vanity and <laughs> she she tells him that she only argued with him because she wanted to distract him from his l- painful sores in his leg and also she wanted to learn from his wisdom like all oh, women smart as fuck 
Uh, she says, she says that she was but a woman with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of my sex because she would never assume to know better about religion than her husband, the head of the church. So, so Henry forgives her, but like, he doesn't tell anybody. So she's literally there with the king and the Lord Chancellor and all the guards. They come through and they're ready to arrest her in front of the king. And he's like, fools! <laughs> and tells him to fuck off. So in 1547, Henry VIII is finally on his deathbed. And he, you know, he thanks God for delivering him a faithful spouse. He basically bequeaths Catherine a £7,000 a year pension. And that's like millions in today's money. And he gives her the right to keep all of the Queen's jewels and clothes and everything else that goes with it. And on the 28th of January 1547, Henry VIII finally dies. And Catherine is left as the Queen Dowager. What she's supposed to do at this point is... Stay a widow. Just stay a widow. Three strikes and you're out. Seems like a good run. And she's supposed to take care of Elizabeth and stay close to Edward the Sixth and be his regent. And she also takes the infamous nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey, into her care as well. So, so four months after Henry passes, she finally marries her quote-unquote true love, Thomas Seymour, who is also a fucking prick. And as such, she loses the sort of the rights and privileges she had as Queen Dowager. And when Catherine's 35, I mean, she's a continual stepmother. That's when she, that seems to be her thing. But she actually manages to get pregnant at 35. So because she marries Thomas Seymour, uh, the Lord Protector Edward Seymour, her brother-in-law, refuses to hand over the crown jewels because they're supposed to be worn by the ruler of England's wife. Because um, he is basically ruling for Edward at this point, Edward VI, he gives them to his own wife, Anne Stanhope, which basically ruins the relationship between Catherine Parr and Anne Stanhope. But Thomas sees this as a personal attack against him by his brother. So at the age of 35, and after being a perpetual stepmother, she actually becomes pregnant. Catherine Parr thinks Thomas Seymour is her one true love. But when they actually start living together, Thomas Seymour starts becoming really, really inappropriate with the Princess Elizabeth. Like, he would surprise her in bed and, like, at weird hours, and he would engage in horseplay and tickling and stuff like that. And he even tried to, and supposedly even tried to kiss her. So, like, like initially, the, um, Parr, she treats this as an innocent thing because she's like, of course she's not going to do anything to this, what, 12, 13-year-old girl. And she joins in, she holds Elizabeth down, Seymour tickles her. Um, but at one point, Seymour playfully cuts Elizabeth's dress to pieces. Catherine's getting, like, well on in her pregnancy at this point. And in May 1548, Catherine becomes just aware of how inappropriate it is. Whether she played it off as an innocent thing before or whether she genuinely believed that this was an innocent act when she catches the 14 year old elizabeth in an embrace with the much older thomas seymour her husband she sends her stepdaughter away was she sent away for her own protection was she sent away to remove herself as a temptation for thomas was catherine parr in a weird hormonal jealousy thing we don't know or was it to just protect everyone and preserve everybody's reputations? Could it be a combination of all of those? Perhaps. It is. We don't know. And although Catherine and Elizabeth had been incredibly close, they would never see each other again. Late August 1548, Catherine Parr gives birth to her only child, Mary Seymour. But she suffers from postnatal complications. Um, I think it's terrible fever, I think as they say. And she dies eight days later, at the age of 36. So even though she's known as the one who survived, Catherine only outlived Henry VIII by just under two years. Creepy fact about Thomas Seymour. So after Catherine Parr dies, he renews his intent to marry Elizabeth because apparently Elizabeth was his first choice of a wife, but the council denied his request so he settled for her rich stepmother, Catherine Parr. 
stay classy, Thomas. And six months after Catherine Parr dies, he ends up executed for treason on March 20th, 1549, because he's trying to circumvent the council in order to marry a 14-year-old. So Mary Seymour, she is... When Thomas is executed, Mary Seymour is only six months old and she's taken in by Catherine Brandon, the Duchess of Suffolk. All of Seymour's lands and funds, they're all restored to Mary. And the very last mention of her is of her second birthday and after that, there's nothing. So it's highly likely that Mary died in infancy. So yeah, thus ends the story of Henry VIII's final wife, Catherine Parr. What have we learned today? Men are dicks. Sometimes what you think is love is just somebody being an arsehole. Don't believe in love. Why would you believe in love? Love is love, my wage. I just, being strong in your beliefs is good as long as you can um protect yourself. Also, if you're going to keep marrying, marry up. What if you poisoned any of your husbands? No, no, let's not go there. No, no, that's, that puts us in Philippa Gregory territory full of nonsense and shenanigans so so okay um i want to thank everybody who's been leaving reviews on itunes thank you so much it's really really handy it just just helps me wiggle up wiggle up that funky apple podcasts algorithm and it means that the podcast gets recommended to more people and shares out there and it just it just really helps if you want to support support on a financial level, you can also go to patreon.com slash who did what now and there's a variety of tiers there from you know general support, one dollar, one euro, something to that effect. Um and then it goes up to like forty three fifty, I think. And like you'll get free stuff and bonus episodes and, and videos and a bunch of other stuff. If you want to contact me, you can do so on and my socials are Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. That's who did what now pod on twitter i am who did what now pd uh because there wasn't enough characters for pod and yeah that's that's all that i think oh we finally did it we made it we made it to the end of the six tutor queens we did it we did it we did i say we you know what honestly if i hadn't got as much support from you guys i i don't know if i would have made it this far so again thank you so much so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a recommendation point. Eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Let's do this. So, so yeah, I thought I'm going to recommend some stuff to you. Recommendations or stuff I like to consume. <laughs> Consuming corner. <laughs> so I have been listening to Small Town Murder and Crime and Sports. They're generally more respectful towards victims and then uh, just take the piss out of out of criminals and shitty shitty law departments and so on and so forth and and fuck ups in the judicial system and I, I actually find their voices quite calming and I listen to them to help me help me sleep um, and that's like if you like crime and true crime and stuff like that and hi Bubba hi mommy mm-hmm I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I love you very much. Is that you recording that? Is that why you're over enunciating your words? <laughs> you're a strange boy. <laughs> and you also you're dressed like a pirate. Farewell, son. <laughs> Mommy, I'm rich. You have money. Yes, and I'm rich. You're rich? Yes. That's good. You can look after me. So, um, <laughs> so here's a, a watching recommendation. I quite enjoy, um, so there's this comedy group on, group, trip, whatever, on, um, on YouTube called Shipwrecked Comedy. And they have this fantastic, um, little mini series called Edgar Allan Poe's Murder Mystery Dinner Party. And so if you like, um, authors and also comedy, and also murder mysteries. It's it's a pretty fun jaunt. And so basically it's Edgar Allan Poe and the ghost Lenore. Um, they host a murder mystery dinner party slash gala and potluck. And so they invite like all of these, all of these like authors from history there. So it's like uh, Mary Shelley, 
Agatha Christie, Ernest Hemingway, H.G. Wells, and uh, and like a bunch of others. And it's 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 funny, and it's tropey, and it's clever. Oh, and Oscar Wilde, and like there's a few more, and it's it's really, it's really funny. It's really funny and fun, and I like to watch it every now and again. It just brings me such pleasure watching it. I really do. I love um the Persauds and Mary Kate Wiles and they've got um Joey Richter. So like if you're a millennial you'll probably recognize these people from the internet. I'm not gonna deny I love this stuff and it's it's very niche but I, I really quite enjoy it. And television wise absolutely Falcon and Winter Soldier it is Mwah! Chef's Kiss. I love it. I love it I love it I love it. Um, but I'm a big nerd anyway, so you know how it is. And the trailer for the Suicide Squad maybe dropped and I was very excited because I didn't like the first film. I just, I felt like, I feel like it was disjointed in the worst possible way. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that now. And if you have any happies you want to share with me, uh, you can tweet me, text me, you can email me at whodidwhatnowpod at gmail.com. And and I'll I'll share your happies. And I just wanna say thank you everyone for supporting me through this month and y'all are awesome. Adios, au revoir, au revoir zen, my friends. Bye bye.